Okay, so in this video we're going to look at the elevator problem. This is a great way for you to demonstrate your understanding of the first and the second law in a situation that's still pretty simple, but really requires a lot of deep thought to, to be able to solve. And so we'll go through all the possible variations of how the elevator problem could be thrown at you, whether it's acceleration or not acceleration, and how that affects the, the forces that you feel inside the elevator. So for this particular problem, we're gonna use uh, Carla, who has a mass of 50 kilograms, and will just simply be standing inside of an elevator uh, car. Now, one thing that I can calculate right now, and we're gonna use this over and over in the problem, is the weight and the mass. We're gonna be using both of them. So since I have the weight, I'm gonna go ahead and calculate what the weight of this person is. For simplicity's sake, we'll go ahead and use 10 for gravity. You can use 9.8, it won't make a huge difference. But for this problem, Carla will have a weight of 500 newtons. So anytime we see W, we'll just replace that with the number 500, and we'll see how that plays out with the forces. Certainly her weight is not going to change because she's going up or down or in how she's moving in an elevator. That's not going to affect the, the weight of the, of the person riding the elevator. So I'm gonna draw several free body diagrams across here. I'm gonna show you two examples of the way that this problem could be phrased, which might seem different, but I just wanna show you that they really are the same thing. And then I'll show you an alternate version uh, where you might see this. Now, the elevator problem applies to much, much more than just any than, than elevators. Anything that you lift up on, or anything that you pull up with a rope or a cable or a chain, it would still show these same forces, and things would work out exactly the same way. You would feel things would feel heavier or things would feel lighter depending on how you move uh, these other objects in this way that's similar to the way the elevator problem uh, works. So let's look first at the free body diagrams. So first let me just draw a simple picture of a person inside of an elevator. Okay, so here's Carla standing inside the elevator. And let's just draw a free body diagram for just for Carla. So I'm gonna draw the arrow down here, the dots down here to indicate the forces that are acting on her. And obviously we would have weight. So that would be W pointing down. Now I'm not looking at the length of the arrows at these points because I haven't been described any motion. So I can't tell you whether the upward forces or the downward forces are winning. All I can tell you is these will be the names of the forces. Certainly weight is pulling down. Now if you look at Carla standing inside the elevator, there is no thrust or buoyant force. There's no friction or drag because she doesn't feel the air moving. Only the elevator feels the air moving around it. But inside, she's not going to feel very much of that air movement. Um, there are no other forces acting on her except for one other force besides the weight, and that is coming from the normal force pushing up from the bottom on her feet here and on her feet right here. So there are normal forces. They combine to point upward, and that is really it. There is no other force acting on her while she is in the elevator. Now, another way that this may be phrased to you, and this is oftentimes really causes confusion for students, is we will put Carla in the same elevator, but this time we're gonna have her stand on a scale. So here's Carla. So now she's standing in an elevator on a scale. Now it might seem like this is a different problem, but as it turns out, the scale does not actually read a person's weight. It only reads a person's weight in a special situation where there's no acceleration. And I'm sure for all of your life, when you've gotten on a scale, you were not standing inside of an object that was accelerating. So there was no complication. And you've come to just believe from standing on scales that they always read your weight, but they do not always read your weight. In fact, the only thing that the scale reads is the normal force. The scale is measuring the normal force. That is to say, here's the floor of the elevator. Here is the bottom of her feet. The two are being pulled together and they are pinching that scale together. And the more strongly they are pulled together. Imagine that I, I put my hands on Carla's shoulders and push down on her. That would push her into the scale even more strongly and you would see the scale read a larger number. But obviously Carla's weight did not increase and her mass certainly did not increase. Why is the scale read more? Because her feet are being pushed against the floor more strongly, therefore resulting in a, a stronger normal force, even though her weight has not changed. So this problem might seem like it's a different problem, but it is exactly the same problem. When you are asked, what is the reading on the scale? You are being asked, what is the normal force between Carla's feet or whoever's feet we're talking about and the, and the floor? Now, one that would be a little bit different, although the principle is still the same, is if we create an elevator, but instead of putting 
Carla inside the elevator. Instead, I'm just going to hang a scale. And from that scale, I'm going to hang a small mass. Okay, now if I think about the forces that are acting on this kind of scale, this is a different kind of scale because instead of pushing up from below, it pulls from above. So in this case, I would be looking at the weight versus the tension. Okay, now, where's the tension really at? The tension is really here in this little string right here. But since this string is connected to the scale, the scale is going to read that tension. So imagine if I was here at the bottom and I pulled down on this weight, what would happen to the scale? Well, the scale would read a bigger number. What if I push up on the weight? Well, then the scale would read a smaller number, but I didn't change the weight, right? The, the scale is not measuring the weight. It is simply measuring the tension in this piece of string. Now, if I don't mess with it and I don't cause any acceleration of any of the elevator or any other thing else to accelerate, then yes, the tension in this string will be equal to the weight of the small mass at the bottom but it will not always, the scale does not inherently read weight. It simply reads either the normal force or it reads the tension in the scale. So let's focus back on the, the original problem, the elevator problem with Carla, and let's take these two equations, and remember they're the same equation, so the normal force is the same as the, the force that the scale would exert if we slide a scale between her feet and the floor. So that's gonna result in an equation of motion that looks like this, when we say the net force Remember, there are two ways to get the net force. One is to just simply multiply the mass times the acceleration, or I can also get the net force by adding up all the individual forces, which in this case is F of N minus W. So if you really look at this carefully, you will see that is not a complicated formula. There is not a lot of algebra to be done in order to solve for this, and there are only four things that you could look for. You could either find the mass, you could find the acceleration, you could look for the normal force, or you could look for the weight, which of course we already have the weight and the mass. The only two things that we don't have is the acceleration of the elevator, because that, that will change with the situation, and the resulting normal force. What will be the normal force based on whatever acceleration we got? Or let's say, for example, if I had that scale in the elevator. Well, I could read the scale and the scale would tell me what was the acceleration based on whether it was a bigger number or a smaller number. So if the normal force is bigger than the weight, that's gonna be positive acceleration and you are going to feel heavier. On the other hand, if the elevator accelerates in the downward direction, then that means that the normal force will be less than the weight because that's the only way I could get a negative number from over here. The only way the left side of the equation could be negative between the mass and the acceleration, well, it's not coming from the mass. It has to be coming from the acceleration. Where does the sign from this side come from? It comes from the balance. So when the two are balanced, no net force, zero on the right side, therefore A would be zero. And when F of N is bigger, we get a positive acceleration. When F of N is smaller, we get a negative acceleration. Now there are basically two things that we can solve for. So I'm gonna draw two arrows here to show two possible things that we are likely to be solving for. So let's solve for A, or let's solve for F of N. These are the two things we'd be most likely to solve for. Okay, so if we solve for A on this side, get a nice easy equation that says that A is equal to F of N minus W divided by M. All I did was move the M over to the other side, but I have to do the subtraction first before I, d I divide by M. And on the other side, if I look at F of N, I say F of N is going to be equal to W plus MA. All I've done is move the W over to the left side by adding it. Now, what's gonna determine the normal force? Is, is there acceleration? If the acceleration is positive, I'm gonna add that to the weight and I'm gonna get a bigger number. If the acceleration is zero, then I'm gonna find that the normal force is just equal to the weight. And if the acceleration is negative, then that means there's gonna be a negative sign in here that's gonna cause me to subtract this from the weight and I will get a smaller number, a number that is that feels like it's less than my weight. And I really want you, as we go through these example problems, think about your experience in an elevator. You have experienced these things. You've experienced this weightlessness feeling, this very light feeling, and also this very heavy feeling. This feeling like you're being pushed into the elevator floor more strongly than just your weight would, would allow for. So as we go through the example problems, really think about your experience in an elevator. If, it, if it's consistent with what you found in the elevator when you, uh, when you are traveling. Okay, so let's go and try an, an example problem and let's start with the, the two kinds of motion. So let's stick with the first law for right now and we'll look at situations that are uh, involving constant velocity. So let's take a look at this specific example. So let's say that Carla in the elevator and the elevator is moving upward at 1.5 meters per second.
Now, it does not say that it's traveling at a constant 1.5 meters per second, but from the context of the problem, it seems clearly it's implying that this number is not changing. Now, it would be better if it said was moving upward at a constant 1.5 meters per second, or if it said that she was moving at a uniform 1.5 meters per second. But even without that extra piece of information, it's pretty clear Carla's elevator is not speeding up and it's not slowing down. So when I look at that equation of motion, right, important to notice this is not A. This is constant, that's constant velocity, right? So that means that, so therefore, zero, because if the acceleration is zero, then no matter what the mass is, I'm still gonna get zero on the left side, and on the right side, we get F of N minus W. What does that end up telling us? It just tells us that the normal force is just equal to the weight. And so therefore, that is equal to, we've already calculated this, if you remember back from the previous problem, we've already calculated that the weight was 500 newtons. So in this elevator that is moving upward steadily, we would find that the, the force that is read on the scale, or that is to say the normal force between your feet and the floor, would be 500 newtons. Now, it does not matter whether the elevator is moving upward or moving downward. I cannot stress this enough. This is the part that is most difficult. So most important, you pay attention to what I'm saying right now. This thing is not accelerating. It does not matter whether it's moving upward. It does not matter whether this says 1.5 or 1,500,000. It does not matter. All that matters is, is it accelerating? If it is accelerating, then we're going to need to find that acceleration and plug it in. But if in the context of the problem, no matter what that number is, if that is not an acceleration, or it is clear that the acceleration is, is there is no acceleration to the problem, then that acceleration is zero. And as a result, the normal force is just simply going to be 500 newtons. So that covers situations that move up at constant velocity, situations that move down at constant velocity, or situations where you're at rest. So let's just make a quick note of that before we move on to the acceleration problems. This applies to being at rest. All right, if that's the first part of Newton's law, objects at rest remain at rest. Or moving up or down. It, this is really important. It does not matter whether you're moving up or down. Up or down is irrelevant. Okay, only thing that matters is, are you accelerating up or down? That's important. But it does not matter whether you're moving up or down with regard to what forces you're going to experience. Um, and that is assuming that you are traveling at constant velocity. Okay, so that's actually three situations in one, all with different values for the velocity. Again, this could be 1.5 or 305. It doesn't make any difference. If you're traveling at constant velocity, the forces are balanced, your, your weight is going to be equal to the normal force. So we've looked at all the possible scenarios that would result from constant velocity. That's, the only thing that's difficult with constant velocity is that you have to recognize it. If you recognize it, well, then the problem becomes super easy because the answer is just the weight is the, is the force that you're going to experience. So let's take a look at what happens when we do actually put a little bit of a velocity into the mix, how that changes the situation. Okay, so we're going to run through all the possibilities. So imagine that we're at the bottom of the building and we step on the elevator, Carla steps on the elevator, and the elevator begins to accelerate upward at 2.0 meters per second. Okay, so there's our equation of motion. This is the only equation that governs this thing. In this case, the acceleration is positive because it said that it was accelerating upward. Upward would be in the positive direction, downward would be in the negative direction. So therefore, as a result, I would plug in 50 times positive two is equal to f of n minus 500. And when I add this over to the other side, I find that the normal force is now 600 newtons. So quite a bit more, 100 newtons more than it was before because of the positive upward acceleration. But look, you can't accelerate upward forever. So at some point, you have to start slowing down and start losing velocity. So let's take a look at what happens in the second example where she is still at this point now moving upward, but we're reaching the floor where we want to stop and get off. And so the elevator is going to begin to slow down. So if Carla's elevator were moving at four meters per second, but slowing at 1.5 meters per second squared, well, that would not change the equation of motion.
The equation of motion will still be the same, but let's think carefully about the acceleration. So let me move this over just a little bit, and let's say I am moving upward my velocity, but I am slowing down. How do you get the velocity to slow? How do you get something to slow down? Well, you have to have the acceleration pointing in the opposite direction of the velocity. So it doesn't matter which way. If the velocity points down and the acceleration points up, that's going to be the opposite sign. When things speed up, it is because the velocity and the acceleration go with each other, and as a result, you increase that number, either both positively or both pointing in the negative direction. I would see my speed increasing. But when I see something slowing down, it's because the acceleration and the velocity are opposing each other. So in this problem, she is slowing at 1.5 meters per second. That means that my acceleration is actually pointing downward and therefore is positive. Sorry, is negative, sorry is negative my mistake v is positive but the acceleration because it's slowing down is negative so when i plug in this number 50 times minus 1.5 now i purposely put numbers like this in the problem because i want to see are you going to go for it are you going to combine these numbers together are you going to put this in as the acceleration this is not the acceleration this is just the random speed that this particular moment in the problem that this, the elevators uh, happen to be moving with. It is not the acceleration and it is irrelevant to anything else in the problem. All that matters is what is the acceleration. So in this case, you see on the left hand side, I now am going to have a negative number. So this will be negative 150. I'm going to add the 500 over to the other side to get a positive 350 newtons for my normal force. So think about this. The elevator is moving upward but slowing down, you're going to feel lighter. Just the same as if I take this small car and I hold it in my hand, okay? When I move up, I feel it feels heavier, but when I come to a stop, in fact, if I come to a stop very quickly, I can make the car actually jump in the air. So the normal force, the acceleration was so great that the normal force actually went away. It went completely away and the car actually got airborne for a moment. But I can lift up on it and not make it get airborne and I can feel that just at that moment where I slow down, it does feel just a little bit lighter. And I think if you were to just put something in your hand that was heavy and move upward but slow down, you would feel it get lighter. And if you've ever been on a ride that accelerated upward very rapidly and then slowed quickly, you felt lighter. You felt almost like you were floating in some cases. That's because the normal force decreased and it gave you this apparent weight of 350 newtons. Okay, well, obviously, Carla's not going to stay at the top of this building forever. So eventually, Carla finishes with her meeting or whatever it is that she's doing in this building, and then she's going to start coming back down the, to the bottom floor. So let's assume that as, El as Carla is beginning the trip on the downward motion, when she's moving at 1.0 meters per second, that she starts to speed up at 2.0 meters per second. Well, in this case, we definitely have a velocity which is negative. But in this case, because she's speeding up in that direction, that means the acceleration must be going with the, with the velocity. So as a result, the A is negative again. So when I plug in the numbers for my equation of motion, I'm going to end up getting 50 times minus two. I don't use the 1.0 because that is not the acceleration. Minus 500. Then F of N, I'll add the 500 over to this side, but I have a negative 100 on this side, so now the normal force reads only 400 newtons. If you've ever been in a ride at an amusement park or at a carnival where it began to move down very suddenly, it began to accelerate in the downward direction, you feel lighter. You feel like, oh, you may almost feel weightless, like you're floating. Your normal force may almost go down to zero if they accelerate fast enough you'll see that the normal force will completely disappear and then you will feel like you're floating. Um, but in this case, the elevator is not accelerating that rapidly, but it is rap accelerating quickly enough that you would feel significantly lighter. She feels 100 newtons lighter as the elevator is accelerating downward in this direction. Okay, that only leaves one last thing. Obviously, the elevator has to come to a stop. We're going to reach the bottom floor. So let's take a look at what happens in the elevator as Carla comes to a stop. There we go. Okay, so now the elevator is approaching the bottom. It's moving at a quite fast speed at four meters per second, but now it's gonna to come to a stop at 1.0 meters per second squared. So if you can imagine the velocity in this case is downward. We're moving down to the bottom floor, um, but we are slowing down. That means that the acceleration must be positive. 
because the velocity is going this way, but I'm slowing down. How would I slow down if I was pointing my velocity in this direction? Well, I would have to have an acceleration that opposes it. So if I have negative velocities, I want positive acceleration to bring that negative number back to zero so that the object will be at, at rest. So in this case, the acceleration and velocity oppose each other because of the word slowing. They oppose each other, and therefore the acceleration is positive. So when I say ma is equal to f of n minus w, this time it would be 50 times 1.0, that's a positive number, equals f of n minus w. So now when I add, sorry, 500, my mistake, f of n minus 500, I'll bring that over to the other side by adding, but there's going to be 100 on that side, so that means that now... So if you've ever been in a very fast elevator and it was moving downward and came to a stop, right at the moment when it started to slow down, while it was moving in the downward direction, you probably felt heavier. You felt yourself being pushed into the floor more strongly than you would normally under, under normal circumstances. Okay, so that takes care of all the possibilities. We can travel with constant velocity upward or downward. We can be at rest. We can accelerate up, we can accelerate down. That leaves only one other kind of special situation that you could run into, and this could run into a whole bunch of different ways that this thing might run into. You might see this besides just the elevator problem. Um, but let's say that, for example, we cut the elevator cable and the elevator began to truly free fall. Now in real elevators that's not going to happen because the elevators have all kinds of mechanical systems that are designed to stop the elevator. Even if the power was out, even it, it will stop it. It has uh, mechanisms that will engage. As the elevator begins to fall, you may begin to feel the falling for a little bit, but it will eventually bring the elevator back to a stop um, using mechanical uh, safety devices. But let's say that those devices weren't there and we cut the elevator cable and now the elevator begins to fall. Well, in that situation, the acceleration, the actual acceleration of the, of the elevator would be the value of gravity, which in the previous problem when we used to calculate the weight, we used 10 for gravity. So I'm going to use the same thing, but really important to notice, of course the acceleration would be negative because you would be accelerating in the downward direction, therefore negative acceleration, we'll use 10 as a simplification, but you can use 9.8 also, um, and therefore we just need to plug in the rest of the numbers to see that in that situation, when I add the 500 over, but then there's a negative 500 already there, and 500 minus 500 is zero newtons. So you will feel weightless. This is called apparent weightlessness. You appear to be weightless, but of course you, you haven't lost your weight. I mean, the, the weight is still the same. It's just that you don't feel the normal force. And when you don't feel the normal force, that's, that's what feeling weightless feels like. You, when you can't feel the floor or anything supporting you from beneath, then that's what apparent weightness is. So that gives you some insights as to the uh, way that the elevator problem looks at. You may want to come back and check this video out again. Um, if you're, you're still struggling with it, just go back and look over some of the example problems in the second half.